Welcome to episode 104 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing director and screenwriter Andrew Haig. Andrew recently directed the critically acclaimed 45 years, so stay tuned for that. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. A couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 104. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional log line and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide quick few words about what I'm working on. I'm still doing rewrites on the spoof comedy that I've been talking about over the last couple of months. It is dragging on a bit longer than I would like, but I did have a nice talk with one of the producers last week, and they're still very much committed to making this movie. So I do think that if I can produce a draft that they like, that they will go and make it. And frankly, even if I don't produce a draft that they like, I think that they will just get a new writer and continue to work on it. So the bottom line is they do feel pretty, um, it does feel like they're committed to making this movie. And so that kind of keeps me motivated to keep on writing. Um, I just was afraid things might have started to get bogged down. They really wanted to shoot this movie in December. Obviously, that's this December is basically over. So that's not going to happen. So it's definitely going to push out into the new year. Um, but they're still, as I said, they're still definitely on track. They're trying to get a director. Um, they just want a draft that they can kind of feel confident and get to the director. And then, um, you know, hopefully get into pre-production here shortly. So definitely still working on that. That's taken up the large part of my writing time every day for probably the next couple of weeks. I did start putting together my Kickstarter campaign. I started to work out all the rewards. I'm trying to look at a bunch of other Kickstarter campaigns, you know, look at what they did, look at what they offered, and then figure out how I'm going to um, kind of lay out my own Kickstarter and the rewards. And I started to write some of the actual text that goes, there's a little like about this project section that you have to write up a little bit of an about. Um, some of the stuff I've read, you know, most people don't even really read all that stuff. So I'm not going to spend a tremendous amount of time on it. Just the sort of the bare bones basics of the project is all I'm going to put in there. Um, but I do think the rewards are important. And so I am going to spend some time on that, really thinking them through, you know, try and be creative and, and clever and, and make it so that people really, um, you know, are excited to to actually donate money. So I figured since this is my last podcast episode of the year, I'd run through a quick recap of all of my various optioned scripts. If you listen to this podcast regularly, I often mention that I just optioned one script or another. I'll typically mention it when I option it. And what ends up happening most of the time when the options expire, a lot of the times I just kind of forget about it. The producer doesn't necessarily contact me. You know, it's kind of when it's first option, there's a lot of optimism and excitement about the project. And then as the months go on, things don't materialize. And then, um, you know, when the option expires, sometimes, as I said, I don't even remember that it expires. I'm trying to um, fix that because I think that is a problem because once the, the option expires, number one, I need to be better about following up with the producer and just see what they're doing. But number two, I need to know that I can start sending out the script elsewhere. So I've got like a bulletin board in my office and I just write the name of the script and then I write the name of the person I've optioned it to and the expiration date. So I can quickly just glance up at that um, whenever I'm thinking about sending out a script to, to a producer and I can just just see kind of what the status is of that. So anyways, as I said, typically these options expire. So I don't typically come back onto the podcast and say, okay, this one expires. Cause as I said, I kind of just forget about it. And I think in some ways that's probably a healthy attitude. Once you option something, you just kind of need to move on to other projects and not necessarily sit there and, and wonder what's going on with this other one. So that's kind of what I do, but I figured I'd run through it, kind of give some updates. I talk about these projects. So you might be wondering <clears throat> what's going on with any number of them. So, um, 
let's see. The first one I, I want to talk about is my horror comedy script. That's a script that I've optioned numerous times over the years, probably mentioned a couple times on the podcast. It is currently optioned, and I optioned it last June or July, I think in July, and I talked about this on the podcast. I optioned it to an Indian producer who wanted only the Hindi rights. It seemed like a very strange thing. He assured me, oh, no, you'll be able to option the other international rights, the U.S. rights and the rest of the world, every place but India. You'll be able to option those to another producer. And for the most part, there's no crossover in the markets. These Hindi films that are made in India, they never get international distribution. Um, I was a little skeptical, but um, I figured why not try it? At that point, I wasn't doing anything with the script. So I figured just as an experiment, let's let's option it to this guy and see what happens. Um, it was an 18 month option. As I said, I think it was in July. Um, it was in July of this year. So it's not going to expire until January of 2007. So I'll probably still be talking about this one on the update at the end of next year. Um, but in any event, I did actually find an American producer, I think in September to that wanted to option the script. I explained the situation with the um, Hindi producer. Oh, and one other thing, when I created the deal with the Hind with the Indian producer, one, I was very concerned that an, uh, another producer wouldn't option it from me. And he said, okay, listen, if you find a producer who wants to option it, you can cancel my option at any time if I have not already exercised the option. When, when I say exercise the option, I mean basically pay me for the script. Obviously, once he pays me for the script and goes and makes his movie, there's no taking that back. But just in terms of the option, he said, you can cancel the option in writing, you know, at any time you want. So I figured that was enough of an out that there was almost no downside to me. So... I found this American producer who wanted to option the script. I explained the situation to him, and he was a little apprehensive, I would say, but um, I was able to talk him into optioning the script and leaving these Hindi rights intact to the other producer. So that was just a six-month option. I think that was in September, so that goes to March of 2016. I haven't heard from him in a couple months, so I'm not sure what's going on with it, but... Um, the bottom line is I have basically the same script option, different markets, but it's the same script option to two different producers. I need to follow up with both of them, frankly, and, and see what's going on. So the next script that I have out there is my baseball comedy. I've mentioned this one a bunch on the show. Last June, I actually flew to Delaware with my writing partner. We got kind of a lay of the land, the stadium that they wanted to shoot at. We watched a minor league game where they were hoping to shoot it. And um, we did some rewrites on the script, had, you know, several meetings with the producers. Um, it was a lot of fun. And I really like this producer. Um, I talk to him quite often. He gives me regular updates, just calls me and kind of tells me what's going on with the project. That option has technically access actually lapsed. I think it lapsed a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago, somewhere in here in, in the mid to early December, because um, I think it was June when he re-optioned. It was about the time we flew out there. So that option has technically lapsed. But again, I've been in touch with the producer. He's still interested in pursuing the project and getting it going. So uh, my guess is we'll discuss something in the new year. And this is pretty common. You know, it's, it's, there's not like, um, there's not like you, like I've just basically said, okay, fine. You know, I'm not going to send the project out. Um, so there's just kind of an understanding that, that we're going to talk probably in the new year. He's kind of getting some things together, talking, rounding up, sort of shoring up some of his contacts. And then we're going to kind of have a strategy session in the early part of next year. And then we'll come, come up with a, um, probably another option agreement. As I said, this is kind of typical where these options will sometimes lapse and, you know, he doesn't officially re-option it. There's a little bit of money involved to officially re-option it. So I think that's probably his hesitation. But, you know, I like the producer. I think he's done a pretty good job up until this point getting a lot of pieces in um, place. So uh, me and my writing partner are perfectly happy to just kind of be in a holding pattern with him and figure something out. Me and my writing partner, we both really believe in the script. We really like the script. And um, so we're hoping maybe we can get involved and actually help out as well. Maybe we can raise some of the money. Maybe the, this producer can raise some of the money. I don't know. But me and my writing partner have kind of been discussing some ways that maybe we can help out more in getting this project going. Um, but anyways, I would say that one, as I said, is just kind of in a holding pattern. The, the option has technically lapsed. And we'll see if, um, if he actually does re-option it. Um, I think I mentioned my teen comedy um, over the the years, the, the two years I've been doing my podcast, it's the same writing partner as my baseball comedy. And I actually uh, first optioned this script 
before I even started the podcast. So I think it was like June or July of 2013. Um, it's a, I think he's in, he's in, I think Denmark, um, maybe Norway. I've honestly, I've never met him, never talked to him on the phone. Everything's been done via email. I found him through my email and fax blast. Um, he did pay a decent amount of money for the option. I think he paid $1,500 for the first year. And then I think maybe a thousand dollars for the set for the next six months or something like that. I don't know, but it was some money for the option. He, I gave him my bank account details and he transferred the money. Um, so he's been very nice, but again, my only contact has been via email at some point, And it was, I think the option actually lapsed last July or June. And after that time period, he said, Oh no, I'm still working on it. I just, I don't want to spend any more money on the option. You know, just kind of let me know what's going on. So again, there's kind of just like a handshake agreement a, a verbal or email agreement that, um, you know, he may or may not be working on this and I may or may not be sending this script out. If I see a lead and ink tip, or if I talk to a producer who's looking for a teen comedy, I will pitch this script to them since it's not officially optioned. Um, but the last I heard, which as I said, was probably like in September or August, um, he said he was getting ready to do some crowdfunding for it over there in Norway or Denmark. And, um, he, um, was asking for a video. So me and my writing partner did like a little intro video of our, about ourselves and we sent it to him. I'm not really sure how that all turned out. Um, so again, this is another one. I need to probably follow up with him, but um, the bottom line is the option has elapsed. I'd say I'm not very confident that he's ever going to get it going. I have a film noir thriller script. I've talked about a couple of times on the podcast. Um, this is a um, script I optioned a little over a year ago. I had a hard time doing the rewrites. Me and the producer, producer slash director, we're not really seeing eye to eye on the rewrites. And I did talk about this somewhat on the podcast. The um, He went and did some rewrites of his own. He still has the material. That was a two-year option. Again, it's not that uncommon. I try and limit the time frames as much as possible. But um, in this case, it was a script I really was not doing anything with. So it's not really a big deal. But anyways, that was a two-year option. I think it was last September. So um, it won't end. End until this next September, September of um, 2016. So the option's a little over a year old now, and then it'll end in a little less than a year because it was a two-year option. Um, I think he's still basically working on it, but I'm not really sure. I got to probably touch base with him as well. Um, I have a sci-fi thriller script. This is one I know I mentioned probably last March. I mentioned I've optioned it a few times. The previous year, I actually optioned to a producer. It did not, for six months or a year, it went and it did not materialize. And then about, um, probably about a year ago, um, maybe January, February of, of this year, I started to blast it out with my email and fax blast service. I did um, find a producer who liked it. We did some rewrites on it. I really liked the producer director as well. He really wants to direct this piece. He's a producer and a director. I really liked him. Um, and we did some rewrites on it and then he sent it out to his contacts and his contacts came back with some sort of negative feedback. They didn't really like the script. And so he got really gun shy and we were having some telephone meetings, kind of just pitching ideas, how we could fix the script. Um, but he just really got gun shy and he didn't want to send it out. And then, um, that's kind of how that was left. I probably haven't heard from him in a few months. This is a script. I mean, for, so for the most part, and this was like the last conversation he, I basically said, so it sounds like you don't really want to send it out in its current form. He said, yeah, I don't really want to. So everything was, was perfectly friendly when we left it. If I see a lead on ink tip that really is exactly matching this, I probably would pitch this script, even though it is technically optioned. Um, and I'm pretty sure I could go back to this producer. If I found interest from another producer, I'm pretty sure I could go back to this producer and say, Hey, you know, this, this, um, producer would like the option. Can you give me the rights back? He probably would, but even if he wouldn't, this option expires in March of this next. So, so it expires in about three months. So if I were to, f I know that this guy's not working on it, so he's not going to exercise the option. He's not going to re-option it. And, um, so if I find some interest on it, worst case scenario is I just have to tell the producer, yeah, it's got another couple months on the option. Um, so I'm not sending it out. I'm not going to send it out using my email and fax blast service or anything like that, but, uh, until the option is actually expired. But, um, if I saw some, you know, if I ran into a producer and he was really looking for something that sounded like it was exactly this, I probably would, would pitch it to him and I might even tell him, yeah, it's option for the next three months. Um, but, um, but I know the producer's not doing anything with it. So, you know, again, it's just one of these sort of gray areas. Um, but I like to keep the material flowing as much as possible. I talked about another sci-fi thriller script that I optioned last summer via ink tip. It was a script that I, um, wrote with a friend of mine, Adam strange. He runs the writer's group that I'm in. I talk about my writer's group all the time on the podcast. He, um, he actually did, I wrote the first draft then he went and took a pass at it. And then, um, he actually posted it on ink tip through his account. And then, um, we got a, um, 
an option from this producer. And he had a bunch of credits. He's not, you know, um, an, an experienced producer. He did have a few credits. He seemed to like the material. We met with him. He's, he seemed like a nice guy. We need to touch base with him. But it was a free option, and it was only for 90 days. And as I said, I, I think this was probably last June or July. So the option expired um, a couple of months ago. So we need to follow up with him. I don't think he's doing anything with the script, but really just as a sort of networking, I need to follow up with him. But that option is basically expired. But that's one that I have mentioned on the podcast. So I would say that one is pretty much over. Um, then the final out option that I currently have out is my female protagonist limited location thriller script. I've talked about this one a bunch on the podcast. If you go back to some of the early episodes, I think this was actually the first option I had after starting this podcast. So probably like September of 2013, I think I originally optioned this to a um, producer in Texas. Um, she had a bunch of credits. I really liked her. She's had a pretty good take on the material. She worked on it for probably a year. It did not go. The option lapsed. And um, I emailed her a bunch of times. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? She never responded. And um, this is kind of an interesting, an interesting sort of aside. So I mentioned the SYS um, newsletter that goes out once a month. And so basically what I did to create that was I have this enormous list of, you know, um, producers and directors, and I do the email, the email and fax blast that I sell. And then I use myself to promote my own scripts. Um, I basically emailed that list of, let's say, 5,000 producers and said, listen, I'm putting together a monthly newsletter of pitches from SYS writers. Would you like to receive this monthly pitch? And I've mentioned this on the podcast. It's a service that I sell. So it's part of SYS select. So I currently have about 200 producers that instead have said, Oh yes, sign me up for that. And there's just a link and they click on it and they put in their name and their email address. So they sign up to this, this newsletter and it's over 200 now. But one of the, um, the interesting things that's happened with that is I get to talking to a lot of these producers is it's not like, I'm not like pitching my material, but anyway, so so I sent out that list, that email to these 5,000 producers basically saying, do you want to sign up for the SYS newsletter? This one producer emailed me back and because I used this same list to market my own scripts, he had actually read this female protagonist limited location thriller script a couple of years ago and he emailed me back and said, hey, Ashley, I remember you. Um, I'm not looking for a lot of new material, so I don't want to sign up for your newsletter, but I did read your script a couple of years ago. What's happened with that? And um, through that email exchange, he actually did option the script. And that one, I think it was last June or something. And it's the same thing, or maybe it was a little later than that, August. Um, but anyways, that I think goes till February of next year, February or March. Um, and I think it was a six month option um, that I gave him. He's a, a producer in the UK. Um, you know, again, seemed like a good guy. He seemed like he had a good, he has a bunch of credits and he seemed like he had a good plan for actually grazing the money and getting the film out there. So um, I felt pretty good about that one. I have heard from him. Um, I, I continue to send out this same email to the SYS newsletter um, or, or to the to the to this list of 5,000 producers. Hey, do you want to sign up for the newsletter now? Um, so I've sent that out a couple of times, and actually I sent it out like let's say a month ago, and he actually responded that again. Hey, I'm still working on this script. We're trying to get this that, and the other thing. So you know that's kind of the update. He's still um, still working on it, and I'm you know mildly optimistic, let's say, on that one. Um, so there are a few other options that I've mentioned um, on the podcast. Hey, I optioned this script or that script. And basically, if I'm not mentioning it now, that means the option has lapsed. And um, I don't even necessarily remember all of those options. Um, but I know there are definitely a bunch of other ones that I've talked about. Hey, I optioned this script. And so those those options have lapsed. And so that's kind of the, um, the unfortunate um, reality of optioning scripts and, and why you need a lot of scripts because for any one of these scripts to get optioned and then ultimately get into production, it takes a lot of, um, a lot, there's just, just, just a numbers game. Most of these options are not going to pan out and um, that's just kind of the reality and I think that's really a lesson learned. I remember when I optioned my first script and somewhat ironically, the first script I ever optioned actually sold and was produced and um, so I kind of thought that was sort of how things went and really I was it was just you know beginner's luck I would say um, that 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 happened so really keep this in mind with your own projects and your own writing you know you need to move on to your next project you need to keep writing new material so that you have a lot of material that you can send out and get option because just getting an option while that's great that's validation it means you know a producer someone who wants to make this movie that's that's definitely um, gets that's great that's the first step but there's still quite a long 
long process before you're actually going to sell something and, and get something produced. And then the next step of that is once you get something produced for that film to actually be successful and actually push your career forward is a whole nother ball of wax. So um, just optioning it is really a first baby step to actually getting this, getting your career going. So keep that in mind. And the way you're going to get a lot of things produced is by having a ton of things optioned. So the other big project that I've talked about on the podcast um, is the script that I wrote in a week last September. That was a writing assignment um, that I got. And it was actually someone I had interviewed on the podcast who remember me. And it was the same sort of thing. I was sending out an email saying, do you want to sign up for this SYS newsletter? And that um, spurred him to write me back and say, hey, actually, I remember you, you interviewed me on the podcast. And that's how we actually got talking about the, the writing assignment that he hired me to do. Um, it seems that so anyway, so the update on that project is basically that it does seem to have ground down a little bit. He had some sort of setbacks in getting the production going. Um, he got sick last week when I talked to him. Um, and when I say talk to him, I mean, I just text messages back and forth, basically saying, what's the update? And he said, I still want to make the movie, but he had been sick. Um, so there's just definitely been some delays. I don't know. I'd, again, I'm, I'm still hopeful that he will make this movie, but there's definitely some of the urgency has definitely um, evaporated. So I don't know. I'll definitely follow up with him probably in the new year. I'll, I'll give him a call or, or send him a text or an email. So we'll try and, and touch base and see what the status of that project is. Um, you just never know with these things. I mean, um, you know, it was a brutal week writing it, but I didn't spend that much time on it. So if it never goes anywhere and, you know, he paid me a little bit of money for it. So um, it's not a complete wash, but um, I still am hopeful. I mean, he seemed to like the script and I think he'd do a really good job with the material. Like he really seemed to like the script. So um, I'm hopeful. Let's say I'd, I'd say that's my how I how I feel towards that one. I'm very hopeful that he will actually make this movie, but I'm not that optimistic about it. So a couple of a couple of asides. Um, as you can see, one of the things that's interesting is running SYS Select has actually helped me. Um, you know, there's the one option in the writing assignment that I've just mentioned, like literally running SYS Select has actually helped me get those, um, those the option and the, the writing assignment. So I think it's interesting. Again, I think it's something really to think about in your own career is just how can you get yourself out there as a screenwriter? And what I'm really finding with this SYS newsletter is I'm really interfacing with a lot of producers. Um, the newsletter, as I said, I have over now 200 producers on this newsletter and I send it out every month and every month, you know, I get a few of them responding to the newsletter and I'm getting, you know, probably a few dozen pitches. People in SYS Select are actually putting their pitches into this newsletter. So, you know, it has maybe 25 to 35 log lines from different um, writers in the, um, in the newsletter. And they're, e they're emailing me back and saying, you know, some of these look good, but they're not quite what I'm looking for. I'm really looking for something like this. So it's just an interesting way of sort of interfacing with these producers. And these, again, most of these producers are people that actually have produced stuff. So it's great to just be on the front lines of that. And again, I would urge you to think about, you know, maybe you start your own podcast or maybe you start doing something like that, um, that can start to get you sort of into the scene with these, with these people and get you interacting with these, these producers. Um, cause ultimately that's what it's all about. Really, no matter what avenue of marketing you use for your project. Ultimately, it's really about networking and those relationships and building those relationships, um, whether it be cold query letters and going to pitch fest or going, you know, doing Twitter, going on Twitter and trying to interact with them or sending cold query letters, cold calling, picking up the phone. Ultimately, you know, yes, you're trying to sell this one script, but really the real goal is to um, interact with these people. And as I said, SOS Select is is um, doing that for me. So it's another side benefit for from running this podcast. And I would urge you to maybe think in those terms. It's not always the most direct route um, that yields the most results. So as you can see, this is the other sort of the conclusion of this. As you can see, um, a lot of the, I'm optioning, I've optioned a lot of scripts and a lot of these are falling through. Most of the options that I'm talking about here are free options. Typically what I do is I give the producer six months for free or 90 days for free. And then I allow them to extend it for like, let's say $500 or a thousand dollars for another six months. And, um, that, 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 that seems to be a, a good, I mean, getting that $500 from them after six months, it seems to pretty much cut them off. I mean, most of these producers don't end up paying the $500. So at least you're only tied up for six months. What I'm kind of thinking about is changing my strategy a little bit around. And instead of giving a free option, just charge, charge that $500 or a thousand dollars upfront for that thousand dollars. What I'm finding is that there actually is a opportunity cost, um, 
in in having all of these scripts optioned. And what I mean by that is like this female protagonist thriller screenplay, this is a limited location thriller screenplay, over the last few weeks, as a concrete example, I've seen some leads in Inktip specifically looking for limited location female protagonist scripts and the scripts option. So I can't pitch it or send it in. And what I'm thinking is, is I might actually be better off. I mean, in my own using my own email and fax blast service, um, you know, there there is ultimately a finite number of scripts that I have that I'm marketing. I would say that's like, you know, there's probably like eight scripts that I feel confident that I think are pretty good, are worth spending money and time to push out there. It's probably, you know, I think there's maybe five of them options, so six, seven, yeah, maybe like eight scripts that I actually like and I'm and I'm marketing. So there's an opportunity cost to giving these people free options. My thinking was I want to remove as many barriers as possible to um, option to um, remove as many barriers as possible to getting scripts optioned which hopefully then some of them will end up being produced um, but as I said there seems to be I'm, I'm not having a big problem getting people to option the scripts but I am having a big problem getting those options to turn into productions and what I'm thinking is, is if I charge $500 up front it will eliminate most of the options I just talked about most of those people probably would not have optioned the script um, but maybe that's good maybe that would weed them out obviously they they haven't produced the movie so not optioning it to them probably wouldn't have cost me anything um, but if I hadn't optioned it to them I would the script would have been available and I might have been able to send it out to somebody else who would have paid the $500 and they would have been more invested and would have had a better chance of, of actually getting it done these these independent producers are not going to give you five hundred dollars um, they're not ri super wealthy people so even five hundred dollars is enough money to make them think and at least they're getting committed for that much you know you can push for more a thousand dollars the more you can get the better there is a point at which you're just kind of being ridiculous well I want five thousand dollars for the option yeah I mean how confident are any of these producers they know that there's going to be um, they got a lot of projects they're working on, so they know they're not going to option or they're not going to produce most of the projects that they're working on. So there probably is some amount of money that you're kind of, you, you would be going and just killing too many deals. Um, but I think me giving away a lot of free options is probably doing the, having the opposite effect. So that's just my thinking right now. I mean, it's a work in progress and maybe next year I'll come back and I'll say, um, now nah, I'm going to just start giving out free options again. Um, the other big factor that I'm including in this is that next year I'm going to be spending, I keep mentioning this Kickstarter campaign I'm launching in January. Next year, I mean, obviously I'm going to do the Kickstarter campaign, but then I got to produce the movie, edit the movie, post-production, send it to film festivals. So next year I'm probably going to be pretty busy on that project and probably not writing a ton of new material. So, um, you know, it's even another reason to try and really consolidate and maximize the value of the, the material that I do have and be a little more selective. So again, it's a work in progress. That's just kind of my thinking now. I could be wrong and, and I could come back and say, yeah, maybe I should give out more free options because if I don't option any scripts, if I can get anybody to pay the $500, and then I probably would be better off taking the free option and just hoping that the person makes it. Anyway, that's what I'm working on. That's the long, the long story. Um, hopefully, it's a nice little recap for the year. And as I said, hopefully, I've tied up some loose ends. Um, I do mention all these options, so I'm just hoping to kind of give, give some idea about where these projects are at if you're following along this podcast each week. So now let's get into the main segment. Today, I'm interviewing Andrew Haig. Here is the interview. Welcome, Andrew, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's good to be here. Thank you. So to start out, I wonder if you can just give us a quick overview of your background in the entertainment industry and really bring us all the way back as far as you want to go, maybe even to your childhood. You know, were you into films as a kid? And then kind of how did you turn that um, turn that into professional, you know, working experience in the entertainment industry? Um, so I was definitely interested in Ned films as a, as a kid, but, you know, not having any kind of family involved in filmmaking, I didn't necessarily think it would actually be a career that I could kind of involve myself in. Um, uh, but I was always like an avid watcher of films from a kind of very, very early age. But then when I left school, I I went to university, but I didn't study film, I studied history. Um, and I think it was only just after I left university that I thought that, um, you know, now could be the time that I could start, you know, trying to kind of pursue a proper career in, in, in filmmaking. Um, mm -hmm. And I started working basically in production, really. Um, I was a, a, an assistant to... Uh, a producer called Ismail Merchant, who's a lot of films uh, through Merchant Ivory, uh, English films. And I worked with them for a year, and then I started kind of working my way up through different, like, production jobs, you know, PA jobs, assistant director jobs, and 
then I ended up working in editing actually for quite a long time and I was an assistant editor for probably, I don't know, pardon, eight years or something maybe, so quite a long time. Mm-hmm. And then during that time I started like writing my own short films and making some short films um, and then I kind of just made the decision not to do any assistant editing kind of work anymore and like threw myself into like, trying to get my own kind of projects off the ground. Um, and I made a very low-budget kind of docudrama feature film called Greek Pete, which was back in, I don't know, 2009, um, just kind of made at weekends for no money. Um, and that got a kind of very small release, and then that led me to uh, working on Weekend, which I suppose was kind of, you know, the film that, you know, kind of got out into the world a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. And then, you know, got to where I am now, really. So it was like a, a slow kind of process of, both realizing that I wanted to be a filmmaker and kind of working my way up through, you know, different jobs within the industry. Yeah, yeah. So let me just dig dig into a couple of those things. I always get people asking me, you know, how do I get that first job? Maybe you can just give us some actual details, like that very first production assistant job. Um, How did you get so just kind of just going from a recent college graduate into um, that production job? Yeah, I mean, it just, I just basically wrote a lot of letters, and I think I probably wrote like, you know, a hundred letters to different, you know, production companies in London, mm-hmm. and I just kept writing and kept writing and kept writing, and then I had some interviews, and, and then finally someone, you know, offered me a job, and in those days they could get away with not paying you any money, which uh, <laughs> thankfully they can't do anymore, which is good, because uh, uh-huh. it's very hard, obviously, to survive in a major city without being paid. Um, but yeah, so I started working for them and it was just, it was just through like perseverance, I suppose, more than anything else. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you just kind of, you know, yeah, take it from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about some of these shorts. Short films are something I recommend on this podcast a lot. A lot of the people I interview started out with shorts and I think it's interesting that you transition from short to a low budget feature, but I'm Mm. always curious to get your, um, just get your opinion of how did the shorts prepare you for that first feature film? Did you have some successes with the short films or was more of it just the learning the ropes of being a, a writer and director? Uh, yeah, it, def- it doesn't, it definitely like, it's just really helpful in just learning to work out how you want to do things and learning to explore mm-hmm. kind of different parts of making films. And, you know, I made a number of short films. None of them were incredibly successful. I had one that, that went to a, quite a lot of festivals and played in Berlin and went to a lot of kind of biggish festivals. But certainly, you know, there, it was about me just kind of learning the ropes, really. And the great thing about doing short films is that you can make all those, you know, hundreds of mistakes. And, mm-hmm. and just like it, it helps you to focus on what kind of filmmaker you want to be. And I think that's the key to it. You shouldn't mm-hmm. really be trying to make a film to be a success at that point, you should just be trying to like work out the kind of filmmaker that you want to be in the future. Yeah, yeah. And so maybe just to give us a little sense of sort of the scope of what you were doing, how many film festivals, you said some of them got into the Berlin Film Festival, how many film festivals would you submit to? I always like to just hear, because I think a lot of filmmakers, they submit to like five or ten festivals and they get rejected and they think that, you know, something is wrong. And in my experience as a filmmaker, I'll submit to five or ten, you get rejected and you just keep submitting to more and more and hopefully you finally get accepted. So maybe you can just talk to that a little bit. How many did you submit to? How, what was your percentage as far as getting accepted? Yeah, I mean, it really depends. There was one film that I made that got in nowhere, and I sent it to, like, you know, 50 festivals and didn't get accepted anywhere. And then there was another film that I sent to probably, you know, 50 festivals, and it got into, like, 30 of the festivals. So I think it really depends. And I, I don't always think that it's necessarily about the quality of the film. It's very hard, short films in festivals, because they can only take so many and mm-hmm. so many short films out there. And it all depends how long it is and does it go with the other films in the program that they're trying to make and you know and I know from a lot of people that that make you know make short films it can be very frustrating and and very disheartening when you spend a lot of money as well to apply Mm -hmm. to all these festivals and you don't get in but in many respects you've just got to keep you know that self-belief up and keep thinking that you know it's going to be all right and you know Mm -hmm. if you get in that's great and if you don't get in you know maybe try and make another one you know or don't make a short film and try and do a you know a feature film that costs no money or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you, you have to accept that you're going to be rejected. Yeah. Now, do you feel like with these short films, you were networking with some of the um, people that were running the festival so that when you came back with your feature film, maybe you had a little bit of a leg up? Was there some networking going on, just meeting people, meeting crew people, meeting producers? 
Yeah, there definitely is that kind of thing. You do end up, um, you know, meeting a lot of different people, and it is important. I think that's the good thing. But then there's also, you know, it's it's hard going to all these festivals. It costs a lot of money mm-hmm. to get to them, and it's not always possible. And I mean, I and I also think that some people end up spending all of their time going to festivals, especially if they've had like a a festival hit with their film, whether it's a short film or a feature film, and then they actually don't get any more work done to to do the next mm-hmm. one. So I think. The key is making sure you concentrate on what's uh, on really important. So let's let's dig into 45 years, Andrew. Maybe you can um, just give us a quick logline for people that maybe haven't seen the film or haven't um, seen the trailer yet. Yeah, it's the film about a, a a kind of relationship that kind of starts to fall apart at the seams after the discovery uh, that, that the husband's ex-girlfriend, her body, has been discovered uh, perfectly preserved in the ice, 50, mm-hmm. a girlfriend he had 50 years ago. And it starts to kind of start crumble and bite away at the relationship that they have at the present. And the film is very much about their relationship and about the wife involved in this and kind of what happened to her. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this script. It's an adaptation of a short story. Maybe you can kind of tell us how that short story got on your radar. Yeah, I, I I discovered it. I was I was um, uh, sent it when I was making my last film weekend, just by the publisher, um, who I knew a little bit, and I just really loved the short story. And it's very short; it's only like 15 pages. Uh, but I just yeah felt like the story was a really really fascinating one to me, and I think it was dealing with kind of issues that I like to kind of explore. And so it was about finding a way to adapt that and expand that and and fill it out into into a feature film and. And, um, yes, yeah, it's a relatively long process. I think adaptation is always harder than you might think it might end up being. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just about really, for me, it's always about trying, staying true to the original story, but also, like, turning it into what I wanted to, you know, turn it into. So that takes, yeah. some, you know, some work and some changes. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about some of the things that maybe concerned you? I mean, one of the things that um, occurred to me as I'm watching this, I mean, I knew that you were nowhere near 70 years old. So it's definitely a story about a very mature couple that have been together for 45 years. Um, And that was one thing that struck me is how does a younger filmmaker, you know, come at this material and be authentic? Yeah, I mean, it's, in many ways, I just decided not to worry too much about it. I always, you know, I always figure that as a person, you don't change as fundamentally as you think you might. So who you are at 20 is also who you are at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, even though you experience a change and you learn more and you learn to, you know, look at your life in a different way, you're still fundamentally the same kind of person. And so I just so try to tell the story from like an honest perspective as I would deal with it. And I think that was what, for the actors especially, I know that that's what they found refreshing, was that it was a film about two people still questioning, still searching, still looking for kind of the answers about who they are and what they want. Um, mm-hmm. And within that, in that context, it kind of stopped me worrying about, you know, okay, what's it going to be like to be 60? And then, of course, you get older people to play those roles, so they become those people. Um, yeah. So I never really worried about it too much. So let's talk about just the next step. Once you've written the script, what were your next steps to actually getting this film financed and produced? Yeah, that's always the hardest thing. I mean, I'm lucky because I have the same producer that did my last film and, and did some of my short films. And, and so I have a good relationship with him. And, you know, and we in, in England, we have the, the benefit of having kind of public money that goes towards making films. So, you know, we go to those kind of public funding bodies first. And they were very responsive to the script and really liked it. And, but, you know, it was actually a relatively easy film to kind of get off the ground financially. And then it's just about trying to find the right people to play them. And then you kind of, you, you know, as I'm a director as well as a writer, once I get to that stage, you know, you cast and then my director's hat kind of comes on. And I, the writer side of me, you know, is put to one side and I kind of embrace the role as a director. Mm-hmm. Did I mean obviously your two leads were were superb? I mean they played the, they're great actors, but they also did a great job with these roles. Did that influence getting the funding? Like do you do you put the package together before you go and try and get this this money, or do you get the money and then go get the actors? Um, we definitely got the money first, which was good. Uh, that was I and mean, that was that was that was, we were lucky in that situation. But then when you get actors like that, it really mm-hmm. does help. Obviously, it, more than anything, it just helps to to give them kind of confidence and, you know, and they, they're, they're just happier with, with what the situation is because, you know, they want the film to be seen by people. Um, but, and, you know, we were very lucky that actors like Charlotte and Tom on board really did help. And it certainly helps 
abroad. It helps, you know, when you're trying to sell the film to other, you know, other countries. All those things become very important. Yeah, yeah, sure. So maybe you can just tell us how can people see 45 Years? Can you tell us um, roughly what the release schedule is going to be like? Sure. So, you know, we've been doing the festival circuit for a long time now, but it's coming out in New York and uh, L.A. on the 23rd of December. And okay. then it comes like nationwide after that, so January and February. Um, so we're doing like a limited release that then kind of expands out after after the holidays. Okay. Um, so, yes. So hopefully it will be in people's towns so they can go and see it. Perfect, perfect. And I always like to wrap up the interviews. Can you um, just anything you feel comfortable sharing? How can people kind of keep up with you? If you have a Twitter handle, you can mention that, a Facebook page, uh, a blog, anything. Yeah, I have a Twitter handle, which I always forget, but I think it's Andrew Haig Film, I think is my Twitter handle. Um, and I've also got a website, uh, andrewhaigfilm.com, I think it is. Um, so people can, can, if they're interested, can kind of follow what I'm up to on, uh, on, those, on those websites. Perfect, perfect. And I assume the film probably has a Facebook page and a Twitter page as well. I think so, yeah. But the, the joy now of having other people to look after those kind of things when you go up the uh -huh. budget level of it is you don't have to deal with those things anymore. But I think there yeah, is yeah. also like a Facebook page and all those kind of things. Well, Andrew, I really, I really appreciate your coming on. Um, this has been an interesting interview. I really enjoyed the film, so I wish you luck with it. Thank you very much. It's really good to talk to you. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, characters, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We provide analysis on features and television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your projects and only have a treatment, this is a great way to do it. We will also write a logline and synopsis for you. You can add this service to the analysis or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your script gets a recommend from a reader, you get a free email and fax blast to my list of industry contacts. This is the exact same blast service I use myself to promote my own scripts and it's the same service I sell on the website. It's a great way to get your script into the hands of producers who are looking for material. So if you want a professional valuation for your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. In the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Michael Buffaro. He's a Canadian writer director who recently did a movie called Wrecker. He's a great example of someone who has made a career without having to live in Hollywood. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. Or actually, I take that back. Keep an eye out for that episode in the new year. I think January 4th, that episode is going to come out next week. I actually am taking a week off. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Andrew. I'm not exactly sure. Obviously, I am American. I live in the L.A. area, so I'm much more familiar with, um, you know, how Hollywood works and how, you know, cinema and, and, and especially, you know, independent film works in the U.S. Um, so I'm not I'm not that up on how funding works in the U.K. If you're in the U.K. or probably any European country, you should definitely figure out how these government systems work. From what I've heard, getting funding from the government is key, especially for a film like this. And what I mean by like a film like this, this is a, as I said, sort of an independent art house film. It's very, very well done, but the marketing of it is not so clear in the U.S. And I think that's why you find in Hollywood, the independent film is predominantly um, these genre films that I talk about all the time on the podcast. It's predominantly these sort of um, low budget action, low budget thriller, low budget horror scripts um, that have a clear market, that have a clear or clear way of making their money back. With a film like 45 Years, these art house indie films, the marketing is not so clear. Making your money back is not so 
clear either. And so they need sort of, um, they just need that help in actually getting produced. It'd be very, very difficult um, in this kind of a climate in, the, in the, the, the U.S. market, the independent U.S. market. These films are still made. I mean, if you go to something like Sundance, you're going to see these films getting made. Um, but in any event, I talked to a Dane, in any event, I want to, you know, preface all this by saying I don't know a lot about how you, how movies are funded in the U.K. or for that matter in any European country. So if you're in, if you're European, definitely figure that out. Um, I think that's really key is is figuring out what kind of films they're making and and trying to decide how what kind of scripts you're going to write and again in in the u.s it's very clear the the there's tons and tons of these low budget action low budget thrillers low budget um genre films getting made so if you are writing in those types of films your chances of getting something made is produced in the uk and in these european countries i don't know that that's necessarily true i think those independent films need to be more like 45 years, which is to say more of sort of an art house bent. I did talk with a Danish director a couple of months ago, so I'm sure I'm not, so I'm, I did talk to a Danish director and I'm sure it's not exactly like the UK system, but it, um, it sounded like, at least in Denmark, um, from this, this particular director's perspective, it was very much a lot of who you know. There was like a certain number of films that the government would produce each year. I think the number was like 20. And a lot of those grants went to the same people over and over again. And this guy thought that some of these directors were absolutely terrible and were producing absolute garbage. And there was basically no market. And he said some of these films were being seen by, you know, a handful of people. Um, but they were in the system. And he was having trouble getting getting into the system and he was having trouble. Um, he was w a working commercial director. He was doing some really cool commercials as a director, but he was having trouble kind of breaking in as a feature film, right? As a feature film director. And he was actually thinking of moving to the U S. Um, so, you know, there's no easy answers to this. It's not like, I think, I think there's always this sort of grass is always greener, um, attitude feeling like, um, Oh, if, you know, if I move to, to, to L.A., things would be easier or, or oh, it would be easier over in the U.K. because they have government grants and stuff. It's not easy, you know, for anybody um, anywhere. And you definitely have to kind of think that in mind, understand how your country works, how your local system works. Um, that's really going to be your best bet. So that's it for the podcast the, um, for 2015. I really do appreciate everyone who takes the time to listen to this each week. Um, thank you very much. I mean, time is precious. And I know, um, you know, I, I choose my podcast very carefully. I have very limited amount of time each week to actually listen to podcasts. So I choose them carefully. And, um, you know, if you're listening to this, I really do appreciate it because there's a ton of podcasts out there that you could be listening to instead of this one. I hope you found some value in the podcast and I hope it's helped you with your screenwriting career. I mean, I just come on and, and try and just give you my perspective and kind of what I'm doing. And I try and interview people and try and pull out as many nuggets of wisdom from them as possible. Hopefully it's helping you. Um, hopefully at least it's entertaining and interesting. Um, but I, I really do genuinely hope that, um, that people are actually putting some of this into action and it's actually helping them. They're actually, you know, pushing their screenwriting careers forward. If you have had some success, please do email me. I love to hear success stories. I mean, it doesn't even have to be anything to do with my services. I mean, if you just found somebody on Craigslist and optioned a script and they made it, you know, that's just great to hear. Um, really anything, any success stories you have, um, I always love to hear them. So please do email those to me. Anyway, have a safe and happy holidays. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next year.